Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Michael Kahn. I'm founder at MCR Labs, and for, the, for those of you who weren't here last time, and I, I'm here to introduce Dr. Jeff Rawson. Um, we, we met a couple of years ago when Jeff was postdoc at the George Whitesides group here at Harvard. Um, Jeff is a chemist, um, which is very near and dear to my heart. I, and I can think of nobody with a, uh, with a better background and a better analytical mind to describe the misinformation in cannabis markets. It's actually a, it's a fascinating topic with a lot of good data to study. And I hope you guys enjoy this talk as much as I know I will. I dropped the clip on Mike. Oops. Okay. Great. Okay. Hey. Good afternoon, everyone. How are y'all doing? Good? Good. Okay. Great. My name is Jeff. I'm a chemist. Um, it's, it's really fun to be giving a talk at Harvard. Um, and uh, I love this building. I, the lab that I teach labs in is actually upstairs. So, um, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't expect to be giving a talk in this lecture hall anytime soon, and certainly not on this subject. Um, and I'm also charmed. So uh, the Veritas Shield, right, is our very, um, Harvard, we're so proud of our, our, our Veritas Shield. Um, it's, it's, it's the symbol of Harvard. And uh, it feels really appropriate that I'm standing at a podium with Veritas on it since I'm trying to tell the truth about misinformation. Um, so, uh, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. Um, so, uh, I, I have seen, and many of you have probably seen, um, some articles uh, on Leafly and other kinds of like cannabis, mostly in cannabis specific venues, um, that mention this concept, or this thing of uh, this THC inflation. Um, this nebulous idea that maybe the levels of THC that are written on products are, but they might not be accurate all the time. Um, who knows, right? It's mostly a, it's often a question, <laughs> um, right? Um, so before I really dig into it, um, I, I just, I just want to show a hands. How many people have purchased cannabis flour in a dispensary in Massachusetts. You can raise your hand. All right, great. Of those people, how many of you think you got what you paid for? All right. All right, fewer people, fewer people. All right, but a little uncertain. Yeah, I mean, who knows how to answer that question, all right? Okay, so, um, so I'm here to tell you today uh, that Many of us are not getting what we pay for. And, uh, but to start with, I think we just have to ask, I mean, who cares or does it matter? Um, really, before you do any science project, you should ask yourself if anyone's gonna care about the answer. So um, it seems like before I give my science talk, I should ask the same question. Um, so let's see, who cares? Well. Um, we just heard Stacy Gruber talk about um, how uh, for patients using cannabis medicinally, the dosing is actually pretty important. So I guess they care. Um, seems like they would. Um, for recreational consumers, I mean, do you like paying for something that you don't receive? Is that like cool? No, maybe not, right? But actually also, who else cares? I think producers care. They certainly should, right? If you uh, lovingly craft your product but, and, and then package it up, um, and then it gets sold in the same store where some other crappy product cannot be distinguished from it, is that good for you? I don't think it is. All right, labs also care. Um, because I have spoken, I've spoken to operators of testing labs across the country. And what I find is all of the people who tell me 
that they got into this business because they care about science and they want people to have accurate information are losing money right now. And actually, this matters to everyone else. The role of cannabis in our society is changing rapidly right now. And this will be the subject of very much research and effort and policy in public health for the foreseeable future. In the next couple of decades, we're gonna be doing a lot of work managing the role of cannabis in our society. And if we do that with crappy data, then we will do a crappy job. So I think it's important to all of us. So um, I think probably m much of our audience here knows this, but uh, in case not, um, in Massachusetts and most places, most states with cannabis markets, there is some form of third party testing. And what that means is there's a lab that is not the producer and not the consumer that tests the product and assures its quality. All right, and they test for hazards like heavy metals and pesticides and microorganisms. Um, and they also test for levels of cannabinoid compounds um, and also test for terpenes a fair amount of the time. Definitely cannabinoids very, very often labeled. Um, so, uh, this is what we're talking about, and the, uh, the, the challenge with making this work is that the producer is the customer to the lab. And so if the producer has an interest in the answer that the lab produces, they're the customer, perhaps they're right, right? Perhaps they can shop for the lab that gives them the answer that's most desirable. So, um, it's, it's, a, it's a regulatory science challenge to make this work. And, um, you know, but, uh, but why, I mean, why would someone have an interest in the answer that the lab produces? Well, for one thing, um, the, the, the price of a cannabis product is partly connected with the level of cannabinoid compounds that are found in it. So it's not a, um, you can see uh, that my plot here uh, looks a little bit like a, like, a, like a kind of a sneeze scatter, all right? It's not a very strong, strong linear correlation, but definitely levels of cannabinoid compounds are correlated with price for cannabis flower and many other products. Um, also, uh, the, 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 way, um, the way that licensing of cannabis cultivation is done is often by canopy. So it's basically by the area. So um, I might be motivated to get more plants into that area, right? So that I have, so that my one grow produces more weight of product, right? But the, the, the counter motivation to doing that is that the more tightly I pack in the plants, the more likely I am to have a bunch of mold, right? So um, uh, if I, um, you know, if, if I know that my products won't be tested for mold, then maybe I don't need to be constrained or worry about it so much. Um, so, um, now, the, the fact that there might be some misinformation in cannabis markets or that it's hard to regulate them, that doesn't, that's not limited to cannabis. It's not like cannabis is unregulatable, all right? It's not that cannabis is, it's not that the cannabis market is unique uh, it's not uniquely dishonest. It's not unique in being profit motivated, right? I mean, this is the way, this is the way, this is the way roughly everything is. And it turns out that in many areas of regulatory science, there are challenges. And so usually what happens for most uh, regulated spaces of uh, the economy um, is often there, there's some sort of a federal agency that kind of oversees it, right? And they might um, set some standards or at least uh, guidelines, right, for how things should be done. That's a pretty typical federal role. Um, and the federal government um, often takes the lead in consumer protection. And uh, the fed federal agencies tend to make a lot of efforts at coordinating research, right? They give out grants. Um, 
they, uh, they, they suggest areas that are important for research. Federal agencies collect and distribute data, right? Just the availability, just the, just the scrutiny and the communication of accurate data itself tends to keep markets more honest. And federal agencies often conduct investigations. But there is no federal agency for cannabis, and um, a lot of these important things aren't happening for cannabis, and there isn't much of a national perspective on cannabis markets. So I founded a nonprofit, and I don't purport to be able to fulfill all these roles, but our, our nonprofit actually can do a lot of this work. We can certainly do some of the consumer protection and data collection and distribution that you might have expected from a federal agency if you had one. So uh, I will tell you about a couple of our um, projects that we did to probe the cannabis markets here in Massachusetts and a little bit about the results. There are, there are a couple of, there, there, there are two main uh, types of operation that I can see for uh, measuring cannabis markets. And one is directly buying products and testing them, right, which gives you just a, it, 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 just gives, it, it just gives you information about what the actual market products are that are in the stores. Um, and then another is sort of an aggregate data analysis. So let's talk about secret shopping first, or off-the-shelf testing, all right? Uh, what this is, is uh, or what, what, what should happen in cannabis markets, is that very frequently, products should be bought off the shelves, and they should be tested. Um, that, that happens in many other areas. Um, and, uh, but th there is a challenge of like, how do, you, how do you establish the authenticity of your measure, right? How do I know when I, when I buy that product and I test it, how do I know I'm right if I get a different number? Well, one way is to have that test of the product off the shelf done by multiple labs. And so that's what I did here, is I purchased, I purchased, uh, I purchased containers of cannabis flour, 3.5 ounces, or 3.5 grams. I divided them up and sent them to three labs. Then I can see, uh, do the labs come up with numbers that are consistent with each other? And are those numbers consistent with the values that were on the certificate? All right. And actually, what I, we, we found that even the, the degree of agreement between the labs itself sometimes gives us a little more information about the product. So an alternative approach that some people talk about is having, this, having a state establish some kind of a master lab or uh, something like that. I mean, that's an interesting idea, but I think there's a problem with, or a couple problems with it. For one thing, Massachusetts has an abysmal track record of running drug labs. So, um, yeah, I think I hear a few chuckles. So a few people know um, that Massachusetts has actually had an extraordinary scandal, it was maybe 15 years ago now. Um, so um, states aren't good at running labs. That's like not one of, and, and actually state governments are also notorious for slow turnaround times on, on, on things like this. So, um, so it, it's not obvious to me that that's a great solution, but also if you, if, one, if you have a disagreement that's between one lab and another lab, that's actually difficult to adjudicate, right? And it's easy to get into what Mike likes to call a nerd fight, where you just start arguing about like who, you know, who uses the right solvent, right? Who, who, you know, maybe, you know, you use that stupid Agilent instrument, right? Like all kinds of stupid, irrelevant things can become points of an argument when, you're, when you have a one versus one argument. But if I have an average of three labs, then I have a little more confidence in that answer, right? Especially if they give results that are highly consistent with each other. So that, that's, that's why I like this sort of a round robin kind of approach. And people have shown ways to make it work successfully, and it's not only me. Um, all right, so, and that's what I did. So I show you here a, a, a set of results from, 
15 samples. It's not very many, um, but it was a lot for me to manage uh, on because I basically had to do this out of pocket. So uh, what I'm showing you, you, you don't need to you don't need to read off all these numbers carefully or remember them. Um, I've got value, I've got levels of THCA, THC acid, and uh, uh, the the yellow column is from the certificate, and the green column to the right of it is what I measured, and. Uh, in general, you can see that the, the, these numbers, they're somewhat correlated. Um, generally, I measured numbers that are lower, right? The thing that's important, uh, the, the thing is important, though, um, to me right now, um, because I, I wanted to know how this is working at all, is the standard deviation from averaging together these three answers from three different labs. And the interesting thing is that the standard deviations are generally pretty low. All right, so my three labs gave me answers that were pretty consistent with each other, like plus or minus a couple of percent. But the differences between my averages and the certificates are larger than that. So I believe that they are real differences and not just a result of heterogeneity of the product. There's another interesting thing, a couple of samples where a couple of samples seemed, for a couple of samples, my three labs got values that were much more different. And we believe that this was a result of heterogeneity of the product, that actually different buds in the container were very different, may have even been, it may not have even been like a phenotypically homogenous grow, right? But really diverse genetics or, you know, May, or may, maybe stuff from a few different batches was actually thrown together, right? Um, yeah, so, um, so we find that this, this kind of approach, it can actually give us a fair amount of information, and even the standard deviations can carry some information. So before I go on, uh, I have to talk to you a little bit about chemistry, all right? It's only one slide of chemistry, all right? But, there's this, there's this issue when talking about levels of THC, which is that you, know, you, you actually need to be a little more specific. Um, so in, in cannabis flower, nearly all of the THC is actually tetrahydrocannabinolic acid, all right? It is the carboxylated version, compound, all right? And it is only in response to heat that it decarboxylates and becomes THC, which is the biologically active compound. And when it does that, it loses three atoms. It loses one carbon and two oxygens. And so the molecule is lighter after decarboxylation, which means that for, from one gram of tetrahydrocannabinolic acid, I can only get 0.877 grams of THC. It's just a limit. So uh, to, to take that into a consideration, uh, usually when people measure the levels of cannabinoids in cannabis flower, uh, they, they come up with a quantity that they call max THC. They take the level of THC that they determine and they add to it the level of THCA times 0.877 times that correction for losing the, the, the CO2, all right? But when you see the number that's THC on the website, they have not usually done that, all right? Usually what they do is they take the number, the, the, they take the, the mass percent of THCA and add it directly to the mass percent of THC without that correction. So it's a little bit, it's just a little bit shady because basically what it gives you is a number that's higher than the maximum THC you could actually get from that flower. It's, it's a little shady. Um, so, and and it's, a, it's a very common practice. And uh, it's really important to note, all right, this website is all I see until I pay my money, okay? When I walk into the cannabis store, when I walk into a dispensary, they show me a screen with their website and they ask me to point out the one I want, okay? It is only after I have paid 
that I even receive the package and can see for the first time numbers from the certificate of analysis, all right? So whatever's on the website is really the only information the consumer gets to make a, on which to make a purchase. So of my 15 samples, 11 of them, right, they were advertised with this kind of bogus calculation of total THC, all right? Four of them, they advertised when they, the, the number that the, the percentage THC that they gave was actually just the weight percent of THCA, which seems like a pretty, you know, honest, it's pretty honest. It's honest enough, all right? And um, so uh, even if I, if I take that, if I take that, that advertised value, right, that just doing that calculation wrong bumps up their value by a few percent. All right, so then there's the additional drop that comes from going to the real product in the package from the certificate. So there are actually two steps down. First, there's the website claim, which often is inflated a little bit by that funny way of calculating total THC. But then secondly, there's the fact that the stuff in the package is just usually much lower in all cannabinoid compounds than what says on the certificate. Right Now, let's keep in mind that there are a lot of reasons that can happen, okay? The, 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 the sample that is tested that gives the value for the certificate, right, is probably not very representative, all right? In Massachusetts, there's, no, there's really no procedure at all um, for choosing that sample. And so uh, what typically happens is the cultivator is allowed to select whatever they think are their very best pieces, right, and submit them for testing, or they'll even submit like 10 samples from the same grow and then use the number they like the best. That, ha that can happen too. There's nothing really stopping them from doing that, I don't think. So, um, so partly there can be a problem of representative sampling, right? Um, now, we always expect some heterogeneity because this is a plant product, all right? It's produce. Okay, um, a friend of mine used this analogy that I stole and I keep repeating shamelessly, where he compared the cannabis plant to a blueberry bush. All right, it's, it's just nice because it's easy to visualize, right? But like, you know, the blueberry bush also produces a bunch of fruits, right? Um, and uh, when I walk up to it, I, I can see really readily because they change color, right? The blueberries are not all ripe at the same time. And they're not all the same size, and they're not all the same. Then some are sweeter than others, right? So in the same way, every cannabis bud is a little different. Nevertheless, right, our relatively low standard deviations tell us that for most of these products, we can measure their content of cannabinoids with pretty good consistency, plus or minus a few percent, right? A, which is a lot, which is a, a, a much narrower range. Uh, than the discrepancies that we see here in these results. So in fact, um, what we found for these samples was that um, 13 out of 15 of them had max THC less than the value on the website by more than 20% of the total value. All right, a few of them, a few of them were half as potent as advertised. All right. But it gets a lot worse because also for 10 of these samples, we had them retested for microbiological contaminants. And even though they were supposedly clean of microbiological contaminants, having passed the state's screening process, we found microbio contaminants in two out of 10. So um, the next time that you purchase some cannabis in Massachusetts and it gives you a headache you might wonder, maybe I got some moldy weed. All right, now, experiments like those are important, and they give us, they give us a measure that's sort of like sticking a thermometer in the market, that it, it just tells us, uh, you know, how, 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 how consistent is this marketplace for consumers? How, how often are consumers getting a good deal? But I don't think that those kinds of measurements are exceedingly useful for uh, enforcement, 
And the reason is because um, I need to do a whole lot of them in order to gather enough statistics to say for sure who might be the bad actors based on these results, right? There are a whole lot of reasons to, for observing discrepancies, right? There are a lot of possible reasons. Determining bad actors this way is not, I don't think, possible, all right? But there are ways, actually, to, to identify bad actors in the cannabis market, and especially in the testing space, all right? And that's by examining aggregated sets of data. So many of you are probably also aware that Massachusetts has a database that they've contracted to a company called Metric, where they record all kinds of data about the cannabis market. And this includes every single test result that is, per, that is obtained on every single cannabis product in, that is tested at any of the licensed labs in Massachusetts. So, in total, it's hundreds of thousands of data points. Now, that is a really big data set, and once you have that much data, you have a lot of power. So, um, what I've done here, uh, and what I will show you on some of these next slides, I have a histogram here, and what I've done, the x-axis is percent of max THC, all right? So that's that derived quantity that's the sum of THCA and THC with the correction for decarboxylation. And uh, on the y-axis is frequency. So basically what I've done is I've taken all the test results or a whole bunch of test results and I've divided them up by uh, how many test results gave me THC between 19 and 20%, how many gave me between 18 and 19, et cetera, all right? And, um, what I get is, is this, nice, this nice curve shape, right, that's called, it's called a, a Gaussian curve or a normal distribution, all right? Um, and that's because this is a natural thing, right? It's a plant, okay? Um, all values are possible, and um, some values are the most likely, right? And deviations from those most likely values have become less likely, all right? Most, most things in nature follow some kind of a Poisson distribution like this. So um, this is a nice fairly, this is a nice normal distribution, sort of like what you should expect aggregated sets of potency tests to look like. Sometimes when you, when you bin up and display your data this way, you see something like this instead. So uh, I've shown the same thing here again, all right? And um, I've, I've drawn a line at 20%. So um, does, the, does the value of like 20% max THC or 20% THC, does, it, is, does that sound important to anybody here? Yeah? Yeah. I, um, I, 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 I've, I've talked to people um, in uh, the retail space, right? I mean, they can't move product, right? They can't, they, it's hard for them to move raw flour that is under 20%. It becomes very difficult, right? Now, let me tell you, the plant doesn't know. The plant doesn't know that it's supposed to be 20% or higher, okay? And it's hard to tell it. So, um, that's why when I look at a bunch of test results, I expect to see some kind of a normal distribution, right? Because the plant doesn't know, right? But sometimes when I look at test results from one particular source or another, I see some big discontinuity right around 20%, all right? Which is a signal that a human being who knew it was supposed to be 20% or greater came along, all right? And when they got test results that were 18 or 19, they bumped them up to 20 or 21, all right? And it's almost the only explanation you can even plausibly suggest for a discontinuity in the data like that. So um, now, I would love to say that I did this analysis and that I already know the names of the couple of labs in Massachusetts that are dishonest, all right? But, um, there's one little issue with that, okay? So I have, obtained, uh, I have obtained output from the metric database 
for all of the tests of flour for THC and THCA. And I ha we have examined that data set, but the data that we received were anonymized. So the only identifier for each sample is that label on the left-hand column here, that big long string of letters and numbers that's called the metric tag, all right? And I have no way to associate a given metric tag number with a given lab, okay? But there is one little trick, and that is the right-hand column. The right-hand column is a comment column that's full of a big long string. A couple of them are blank, actually, right? That's also a string. It's null, right? Um, but it's full of a string, and you can see that different people filled in that comment very differently, all right? So actually, if we, we can use the comments to divide up test results that came from particular sources, right? If they use the exact same comment as another test result, it probably came from the same lab. So uh, we did that, and, um, and we, we actually divided them up and then performed the same analysis, and we found that, say, for, for comment A, I'm calling it, right, one type of comment that I associate with one particular lab, right, I see quite a nice normal distribution of test results. But then, for others, like comment B, I see a big discontinuity. So now, all I need is for the state to tell me what lab gave comment B, right? And I, and I, know, and I know that these data are adulterated. So um, there are many other ways that people might try to game the system. And I think that, um, I think that direct adulteration of the numbers is probably the stupidest <laughs> and the least efficient and the least likely, all right? But it happens. And, it sh and it's easy to stop, and we should stop it. So in conclusion, uh, testing labs serve cultivators. All right, they, they do. Um, and misinformation is currently common and in the cannabis markets, and that's a big challenge, all right? Again, this doesn't just matter to a few cannabis consumers, all right? We're not just talking about a few people got 20% less high than they thought they would, okay? It's a lot more serious than that because there's a big question now. How do we do public health in the age of misinformation, right? And I think the way that we do it is open data, open communication, and clearing up that misinformation whenever we can, all right? The two most important things to do are off-the-shelf testing and regular analysis of aggregated data sets. And to do that, I founded a nonprofit, and I, uh, I hope I can count on support. Um, it is a nonprofit, and so your donations are tax deductible. Um, and uh, I will be really glad now to answer any questions that anyone might have or engage in any other kinds of discussion. It's really fun to be here. Um, I want to thank Mike uh, and MCR Labs for uh, setting this thing up and all of you guys for being here. Thanks so much. All right. Uh, question. I don't know who to, I don't know how to choose. Um, all right. I think the person up in the top waving his mask is the first person I saw. Yeah. Well, let's see. So that calculation, um, that calculation is taking into account that uh, for one gram of THCA, I just can only actually get 0.877 grams of THC, all right? So the molecule just has to lose a little weight before it works in my body. But, um, but 
I, I think that the, the conclusion of my talk is that there are more challenges than just that to believing the number that's on the package, all right? And that number on the package is not something I would take very seriously at all right now. All right, yes, in the yellow hat. Mm -hmm. I've done the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 The, yeah. But even the, even on the same bud, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, even on the same, even on the same bud, and actually, you know, th this is still actually an an open area of science, right? Is um, you know, even even like like the, the like like the the physical science of the cannabis bud is not even that well understood yet, you know, like um, no, but I don't think anybody really knows like how 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 often. Is the con the the say the concentration of cannabinoid compounds the same across the whole bud, or maybe sometimes the tip is richer or the back? I don't know, man. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think anyone really knows yet how variable they are. The one thing that I have noticed, all right, and it but it's sort of still an anecdotal observation. It seems to me some packages had very small buds. And those gave very high consistency. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And so, and, and I agree, you know, there will always be some internal variability, right? And there will always be some heterogeneity. And I think that one important task is to establish what's a reasonable variability, right? Um, but I think what's not reasonable is if every single product that I test always comes out well below the value on the certificate, then I'm suspicious, right? Um, if it's random variability, right? I, I, so I, some, in some way, we need to get that number on the certificate to be a little bit closer to representative of the experience of the consumer, or else it's just a worthless waste of money and time for everybody. Yeah, Marion. Yeah, thank you for this presentation. That sounds great. Hmm. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah, I. Well, synthetic. Yeah, synthetic cannabinoids. That's a really. It's another really challenging ball of wax. Um, I think it's really concerning that. Um, I think it's really concerning that these uh, compounds are sold so freely and that nobody seems to care what's in them. Um, I myself have used, I used Delta-8 THC quite a lot in my lab um, because, of course, I was working at Harvard. I could never bring any real cannabis into Harvard at all, okay? Right, that's like the, you know, the federal prohibition means that the, st you know, the terms of our federal grants, I can't even get this stuff near an instrument, right? So for a while, what I did, because Delta-8 THC was in this nice legal gray area, um, I used it as a mock-up for Delta 9, all right? And I would purchase it from companies like Fresh Bros, Healthy Supply. And 
every time I purchased it, it would be a different color. And I even called them up one time and asked them about it. And this guy called me up, and I, it sounded like he had just rolled out of bed. And he said, yeah, man, I mean, it just always looks different. So these are the kind of, you know, these are the kinds of chemical producers, right, that you're buying from when you buy these products, and they're not, they're not tested in any way, right? They're all, that's also really concerning. And many of them, I mean, there's no telling what's in it. Right, I mean, we, you know, we examined them. There's no, you know, there's no such, there's almost no such thing as a completely pure sample of just one cannabis compound, right? They're very difficult to separate from each other. And um, the, synthes the synthesis processes for making synthetic cannabinoids usually don't make only one product. They usually make multiple products and multiple isomers of them. So, um, yeah, that is a, that's a very challenging area, but it, it, shouldn't, it should not be an unregulated industry. That's a bad idea. Yes? Hmm. Yeah. My understanding is that there are four companies in the country that do synthesis yeah. for various cannabinoids. Yeah, I concur, and I think that's a real challenge, right? So, um, yeah, so the, 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 the question is about standards, and l let me just explain real quick. So the way that these cannabinoid, the way that the levels of these compounds are determined is that usually what happens, the lab takes the cannabis flower and they extract all of the organic compounds that they can into some solvent. And then they inject that solvent into an instrument that separates all the organic compounds that were extracted and tries to measure their levels, usually by absorbance, sometimes other methods. So um, the measurement is tied to a standard. The only way I know the concentration in that solution is by comparing it to another solution that a company sells me with a known concentration. But the issue is that standard solutions from different companies actually have different concentrations even though they're not supposed to. All right, so this is an additional challenge for labs. I know that for the small data set I have, I don't see any sign of my three labs having systematically different answers from each other. Um, but I think this is a problem. The problem is that the often, you know, in the end, the measurement is depending on some black box, which is, this standard that comes from, the standard solution that comes from a company. Um, and I have a couple of ideas about how you, about how you, um, how you sort of, uh, there, there, I think there, there has to be a way, and I, I think there is a way to, um, to assure yourself of the true concentration or, the, or the, the true quality in your standard solution before you start. I think there, there's a, I think there's a way to do that, but, um, but yeah, I think that that's hard. That's an, that's an additional challenge. And you know, again, because of the unique legal status of cannabis, um, that's another contributing factor that makes it hard to have good standards. So yeah, it's, it's a challenge that we can work on. Yes? Mm hmm Yeah, yeah, that's a really great point. Is yeah, and um, I, I'm actually I'm, I'm gonna for that point I'm gonna actually go back to a picture. All right, so yeah, so um, I actually I, I looked at both. So um, I for each of my 15 samples I I looked up the value that was on the COA, 
And I found that often, right, that max THC calculated correctly on the COA is different than the value on the website, right, usually. Again, because they, there's usually some motivation to come up with some other cockamamie way to do total THC. Yeah. No, but it's the reach. Yeah. That's a choice of the reach. You're right. Exactly. That's the person who made the website, right? When, um, when, the, when the analysis is performed, every, like every, every, at least every lab that I worked with, right, when they perform their analysis, their certificate, their certificate says in really big letters and numbers, the max THC. It is on the initiative of the, re this is the, initiative of the retailer to come up with a different calculation that comes out with a bigger number. Um, so it's, yeah, it's definitely, it's not the producer choosing to use something different. Yes? Mm-hmm. Oh, so that some of, some of the products that I examined, right, had COAs that were provided by labs that participated in my study, and some didn't. And uh, if you, the thing is, if you do this right, if you're always, if each product is tested by multiple labs, um, and, you, uh, and, you, and, and if you use all of the labs uh, in sort of a round robin style, um, you can actually, you actually get around any dishonesty, right? Because people don't know when they're retesting stuff that they provided the certificate for. I, I don't think I can say anything about it. The problem is that I have such a small sample size. There are, I think, maybe eight major labs in Massachusetts. I don't know, it depends on how you call major with the threshold, but um, you know, I, you would have to, in order, in order to direct, in order to use an experiment like this to directly find fraud at labs, you would need a really large number of samples, really large. And it's hard to ever know. Like, again, I don't know the explanation for each discrepancy I see. It could be that the cultivator sent the lab some totally wrong bud that, ha that didn't come from that batch, right? We don't have like a very good system in Massachusetts for assuring that representative samples are tested. So um, a COA could give me a number that seems very inaccurate based on my testing, but it might not be the fault of the lab that provided the COA at all, right? Um, there are a lot of different explanations. Yeah, that's a that, that's a great point, and um, I um, yeah I um, completely. I completely, I, you know, I also, I want hope, <laughs> right? And, um, and, I, and I've got good news, all right? There is hope, all right? You don't control what you don't measure, okay? So right now, our cannabis market is a little out of control because nobody's measuring it. But I'm here to help, all right? 
Simply the act of performing the measurements on a regular basis and publicizing the results will be the strongest force for making this market honest. That will be more powerful than any enforcement action, although I do agree accountability is needed. Yes, I think I, I think I saw a hand, yes. Hmm. That's a great question, um, and we, we, we did ask ourselves about that, right? Um, so, um, uh, but the, the fact is that these, these uh, it's, it's true, all right, cannabinoid compounds in general, right? This is a general character. They're, they're pretty electron-rich organic compounds, all right? And so they tend to oxidize, okay? But most of the cannabis that I've purchased in Massachusetts is packaged under inert atmosphere in a sealed container, all right? Quite a lot, I mean, many packages, not all, right? But many packages are. Um, and it's stored at room temperature in the dark. So at room temperature in the dark, in the absence of oxygen, there's actually not a lot of chemistry that happens to cannabinoid compounds, all right? Now, that doesn't totally rule out the possibility that degradation influenced our results, but the, the chemical pathways of degradation of cannabinoid compounds are known, all right? And it is known, it is known that if your THC has decayed a bunch, then you should find a bunch of cannabinol, all right? We didn't find cannabinol, right? We found exceptionally low concentrations, all right? There was no sign, right? There are chemical signatures that tell you, oh, there used to be a bunch more THC here, but now it's decomposed into these other compounds, right? So, um, so I, 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 don't, I, don't think that, I don't think that sample aging um, had a big fat, was it played a big role in the discrepancies that we see. Um, there's another reason for me to believe that, which is that these products just don't sit on the shelf for that long, right? I mean, I, never t I didn't test a product that had a COA that was older than six months, right? And most of them had COAs from just two months prior, you know? So, um, yeah, the inventory, if, it were sitting, if the inventory were sitting around for years and stored badly, then that might have been more of a factor, but I don't see any sign of it. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, so the thing is that, all right, well, the challenge, <laughs> the, 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 this comes down to like the, actually in a way, sort of like the, yeah, the, 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 the physics of any kind of analytical measurement, which is that, um, right, at every, every scientific instrument gives some kind of a, um, you know, some kind of an electronic output in response to some stimulus. Right? But the strength, the correlation between the strength of that electronic output and the level of that stimulus is different for every compound. Right? So I usually need to run some kind of a calibration standard to calibrate my measurement. And in fact, it, it's a fundamental principle of chemical analysis that it should always, you know, you, you always have to have some kind of a standard or some kind of a comparison. Um, Well, that tells me zero, and then so I see, but the challenge is I, 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 I run my solution through my instrument, and I get some peak, all right, and, uh, and I see that it's, it, there's a peak, and it's not a flat line, okay? So I know the answer isn't zero, 
but I don't know how to connect the area of this peak with concentration unless I have some kind of a standard with a known concentration. I shoot that through, I see exactly how big its peak is, and I say, okay, so when the peak has this area, then that corresponds to this one milligram per milliliter or whatever concentration, right? So um, that's why if I have two different standards that are different concentration, then they're gonna give, they're gonna cause me to get different answers for everything. Sure. Yeah, so I think that um, I think it's selection of genetics, and um, you know, like maybe you know, and, and and improvements in cultivation technique can can elevate right the the average, um, but I don't see how that can be responsible for such a big discontinuity, right? The cultivator would have to know ahead of time and not send. They would have to. The cultivator would have to have some kind of knowledge ahead of time and not send out for testing any product that was a hair under 20, right? Um, so how, how, do they, how do they know that before it's tested? Yeah, yeah, and that discontinuity is not something that every lab produces. It's only a couple of them that have. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that, that's a fun, that's a fun story because yeah, so I had a different experience in every dispensary with that. That was like a big difference, all right? In one dispen in a couple of dispensaries, I mean, they're so fast. They know exactly what to do. They just give me the COA, right? That happened a couple of places, okay? Then there were a couple of places where, you know, one person has to ask the next, ask, you know, it almost, you know, and finally they figure it out. They get me the COAs. Then there were a couple where they lied to me and they said that they can't do that. And then there was one where my asking the question just broke the system. <laughs> and they were like, and eventually, some, eventually the guy was like, just scan the QR code there and just like, just, just get out of here. Just aren't, aren't you happy? Like, you got your weed. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but it, one of the things I found also, you know, the values on the COA almost always get printed on the package. And the one thing I have seen that's consistent, I've never seen a discrepancy between that. I've never seen, I've never seen anyone print a number on the package that didn't actually come from the COA. I would be really interested if that happened. It seems like nobody, that's never occurred to anyone, I guess. Uh, all right, yeah. Sorry, there's a lot of questions. I wanna get to everyone, but. Yeah, I haven't examined that yet, but I've heard a lot of anecdotes about that. Right, so um, yeah, people, so, 
many people suspect that, um, that for hemp compliance, that there are labs that are sort of rounding down or fudging numbers downwards to keep it beneath that, that threshold of 0.3% THC. Yeah, that would be really interesting to look at. All right, yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, I went to I went to seven dispensaries and I I don't think I would draw any conclusion. I I I don't I don't feel like that's systematic enough to to say anything about like what are good dispensaries or bad ones. I mean, I had one that I thought was pretty dingy. Um, and less professional than the others, but um, there's more like a stylistic interpretation than like really data. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, what I you know what I found was that there were a couple of dispensaries that um, you know that that gave more precise information. Like they instead of just saying, oh, it's you know 35% THC. They, gave, they, they provided the percentage of THCA, all right? So, um, but I don't, I, I, don't, I, don't think I'm, I don't, I don't think I've done enough work examining dispensaries to say anything systematic about dispensaries right now. All right, uh, yes, this question. Uh, yeah, I mean, really, I think that the, um, I think, I think, I think it's the, I think it's the, I think it's the, yeah, so I, I think that there, there is a challenge, like, part of what the challenge is here is an incentive problem. Um, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so, um, Yeah, and you know, there's there's kind of this fundamental like domino effect, right? The, uh, of economic pressures, right? The consumer shops based on THC percentage, right? And so that means that the dispensary sells based on THC percentage, and so that means right, the lab sells, right? So. Yeah, I think, I think it's an interesting idea. I, I think that just the, I, I, I think that just the checking up on each other, mm -hmm. I think that that already actually can work. I think that having a round robin system where labs are checking up on each other is already, it's already gonna turn out to be pretty hard to game. I mean, maybe someone will figure out how, but I think it's a good start. Yeah, I think that setting up, setting up an additional lab that's somehow going to be the master lab I think that just that includes a whole lot of additional challenges and problems that I've seen a lot of evidence in the past that state governments aren't usually good at solving. So, um, yeah. So I, I, that's why I tend that's why I tend to look for another s solution. But um, but I, I agree it's something that still needs to be discussed more, right? Like I don't know exactly what's the best policy here. All right, well, it, 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 it doesn't seem like there are any more questions right now. Oh, wait a minute, someone raised his hand, yes. Oh man, <laughs> thanks dude. I, um, 
I tie-dyed, all right? Everyone needs a hobby. <laughs> um, and I just always really liked bright colors. So, um, yeah. Thanks for the question. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. I'm happy to talk again.